Welcome to the Braveyard. Today's guest is a drag icon, social media extraordinaire, and author of the brand new book, Math and Drag. They're best known for competing in Canada's Drag Race Season 1 and have a combined audience of over 2 million followers. Please help me welcome to the Braveyard, the one and only, Kine. Hi, Kine. Hi, how, how are, are you? How are you? Oh, I'm good, thank you. I'm good. It's the holidays right now. I mean, obviously when people are listening, it won't be, but um, how is your Christmas going so far? Have you got all your shopping done is the classic question. I actually, I actually just did it today. It was a little bit of a last minute shop, um, but I'm, I'm loving it because I have been traveling for so many weeks and I've been away from home and I just got home last week and it's, I'm just feeling so festive and cozy um, and I love seeing my family. Oh, and now you're back home in Ontario, where I'm yes. sure the weather is very different than where you just were. Yes, yes. Well, I spent a month backpacking in Central America. So I had just come from Costa Rica, where it's like so hot and humid, up to Ontario, where it's um, the complete opposite. Um, but I, I don't mind it. I like it. It's a nice change. You know what's really funny? Because uh, I was watching some of your posts and you posted about the animal shelter in Costa Rica and they reached out to me. They wanted to fly me off for an influencer program. And oh, I girl, just, you should do it. It's fun. I was just going to ask you, I'm like, was it amazing? Because I love animals and they're like, look, it's a shelter. We have like hundreds of animals. You get to do all these adventures. So I need to hear all about it. That is so funny because actually when I got the email, I was like, oh, this like looks like a scam. That's what I but, thought. But he sent me like so many videos of other people that, that had done it. So I was like, oh my gosh, actually, like, why not? I, I love to travel. I'd love to go to Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I went. It looks just like the pictures. Um, and it, it was so much fun. Oh, uh, how many animals were there? Like what types of animals? Like 1,600. So basically, it's like a hotel that's also an animal shelter for everybody listening. It's called Lands in Love. And they have an animal shelter at the hotel. Um, so it's kind of just this crazy mix of cats, dogs, chickens, horses that are like barking all through the night. But it's kind of far enough that you do get some quiet from your room. So it's just fun. And then you're in the middle of the um, cloud forest in Costa Rica. Wow, that must have been crazy. How long were you there for? Five days. Jealous. I well, I mean, I guess I can go, but yeah, I honestly, you can. <laughs> I thought it was a scam too. Like I got the email and we get all sorts of emails. And mm -hmm. I was just like, uh, this doesn't look like one of the ones. It didn't go through <laughs> my management company. It came like directly to like one of my old email addresses. I don't even know how they got it. And so I sent it to my manager anyways and was like, Can you just look? And she's like, Court, it's legit. So if you mm -hmm. want to go to Costa Rica. <laughs> I had just gotten back from England, though, and trying to think about traveling again, I was just, I couldn't do it right now. I was like, I need to I know. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of exhausted, too. Where in England did you go? So me and my partner went, um, we have friends that live up at, near, like, Lake Windermere. So we went and did, like, Oh, districts. my gosh. That's literally where my husband's from. I was just in, no just at Lake Windermere. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. When were you there? Um, last time I was there before you, I, I'm like August. I was there in August. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we were probably there at the same time. That's so funny. Um, yeah, we did Windermere, which is beautiful. If anyone's thinking of going to England, like, please go to Lake Country because Lake Country is absolutely stunning. It looks like a scene from like Lord of the Rings or Game mm -hmm. of Thrones or something. There's castles and rolling hills and it's just, it's, it's magical absolutely, there. it is, it's magical. And then we went down, um, so my partner's family's all from Gosport. Very different vibe. From, oh, I've never heard of it. Yeah, th there's probably a reason. Not to just <laughs> Gosport or anyone from Gosport, but um, it's just, it's like an old naval town. Mm. So it's like as far south, basically, as you can go in England. And it's just oh. buggy. Well, when we were there, we got there in a heat wave. And so England was like the hottest it's been in ages. And it felt yes. like you were in like a humid Mexico, but with no relief. Like, 
There's no pools. Nobody has AC. Nobody's prepared for right? in England. You know, one, one time I was there, one of the summers, I, I made my, um, my partner buy an electric fan. And they'd like never even heard of one of those. Because that's how much they didn't use AC or fans they back don't then. Use no. And now all of a sudden they're like, you think you're in the middle of the desert. It's so hot. Like we went for like 10 days a year for 10 days a year. And then that's it. (laughs) And it was the 10 days we were there. Of course, like the day we flew out was their first cool day again. The day we landed was the first day Mm -hmm. of like a three week heat stroke there. So it was anyways, super funny. But I'm a change for you. Right. And then we went to London for a couple of nights, which was great. I got to go and see some theater, which I really wanted to do. And um, like I wanted to go see a musical. And London's just so cool. There's so much. It's like the British New York. Like, I yes. don't know how else to describe it, but it, yeah, you just feel fantastic. like you're in like a major city. Yeah. You feel like you're at the center of the world. London is, if you think about it, it's their Wall Street and their Hollywood and... um their Broadway, and their Washington, D.C., all in one city. Wow, actually, that's a really good point. I never thought of it that way, but it's true, and it feels that way. But people are just, I feel like, you get more smiles than you do in New York or Hollywood, Mm -hmm. for sure. Like, last time I was in L.A., I feel like you get more up and downs in L.A. than you do, like, a genuine smile of somebody like, oh, hey. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But, I mean, that's L.A. for you. (laughs) Jumping into it a little bit, obviously, you had a big break from Drag Race, and I'd love to cover a little bit just about your experience with Drag Race and a couple of questions, because I have so many friends that do drag, and I absolutely love and adore drag. And I feel like now there's kind of this almost like a stigma towards Drag Race and like the culture Mm -hmm. that it's created towards drag. Do you have any opinion on the shift that RuPaul and Drag Race has had in drag culture? I mean, I can't really speak for that because I am one of those queers that started doing drag because of RuPaul's Drag Race. So I'm like sort of on the other side of that debate. I I have no um, stories of what drag was like before um, Drag Race really blew up because I feel like before I found out about Drag Race, my opinion of drag was like, oh, it's these like men cross-dressing in bars. Like I didn't really know a lot about it and I didn't really think very positively about it um growing up just like a Catholic Filipino boy um but it was through seeing Drag Race that um sort of changed my opinion about drag and saw oh these are actually people who are just like me people who are kind of androgynous they're really creative and this is their creative art form um and it totally spoke to me and at the time I was sort of experimenting with makeup um So I feel like I was just somebody who um, really benefited from watching Drag Race. And now as a working drag queen for the past like six, seven years, I also see how Drag Race has expanded our economy and given us so many more opportunities by introducing us to so many people. So Uh um, I, I know what people mean when they talk about how Drag Race has sort of changed the drag industry, maybe in some ways that are negative, but I feel like in my personal experience, I can only speak positively for what Drag Race has done for um, the world. Mm -hmm. How was your experience on Drag Race? Because you came in, you know, you won the first mini challenge. I did. And then I feel like after that, there was almost just like a, like, there was a shift in the time space continuum. Right? Okay, yeah. (laughs) I was like, how do I, because there was a shift, but I feel like I was watching and I just thought you were so funny. And I was like, I feel like people are just not understanding your sense of humor. Everyone was taking everything so seriously. And there were serious moments, but like you were also defending yourself and and doing what you thought was right. (laughs) And then all of a sudden it was just like everyone's opinions obviously got so strong. Did you feel like there was like a weird shift? Are you still friends with the queens? Like how did Um, I raise up for you? I have a lot of thoughts on this. First, I'll start off by saying that I went into Drag Race as kind of a beginner queen with a feeling like I had something to prove. And I feel like it's changed me so much in that I went in feeling like, okay, I have to act really, really confident and like really not let um, myself get in my own head. So I kind of went in a little bit too overconfident, I think, (laughs) with me like really trying to make everybody laugh. And I do have 
I guess, a dry, sarcastic sense of humor, which is another thing that I've had to learn from Drag Race to sort of tweak a little bit as I'm sort of learning more about my drag persona. See, um, I love it. And I love when queens have dry, sarcastic senses of humor because I feel like the comedic timing that plays off of them is just like when people commit to it, it's absolutely <laughs> hysterical and you do it naturally. But oh, I feel you. like people just misunderstood it like right from the get-go. Yeah, there was that. Um, that was, you know, it was there. But I guess the other thing that sort of shocked me was like, going in thinking, oh, everybody's my friend, all the producers think I'm so fierce, to sort of being on that main stage and them saying, oh, kind, we actually are not feeling your outfit, girl. And then my script that I had orchestrated in my head was just like, uh, 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 like it was going off script and off the rails. And I think it was just my, my tragic downfall from there. But What was overall, your script I, that I was in fun. your head? Listen, I thought I was going to go straight to the end. I was like, okay, kind, you're probably not going to win because they'll want like a more experienced queen to win, but maybe you could be top three. That's how I saw things playing out in my delusional mind. <laughs> but I think maybe every drag queen needs to be a bit delusional to, to get ahead in life. Obviously, it didn't, it didn't pan out that way, but it sort of humbled me. Well, I loved it. And I loved your experience. <laughs> I love watching you. And you're such a delightful person. I think that are you friends with any of the queens from your season? Did you reach I out am. afterwards? I am. Um, probably I'm, I'm the closest with Boa, ironically, even though I, I fight with her as soon as I get in there. Mm -hmm. um, but, but she and I are pretty close and, you know, I keep up with all of them, really. Oh, I love that. How do you feel drag impacted your queer identity? Do you feel like it opened doors for you to be able to be more vulnerable now and uh, allow yourself to be present in moments? I think for me, drag represented an outlet for my creative feminine energy. You know, I grew up always like putting a towel over my head, wanting to sing and um, wanting to to live that fantasy always. And I, you know, used to pray, oh, my gosh, I wish I could be a girl. I just feel so uncomfortable as a boy. And then those feelings sort of when I was in high school, they manifested themselves into me sort of playing with gender and playing with with makeup. And then I think drag sort of when I, when I discovered it, I realized I could channel all of that feminine energy into this drag character. Mm -hmm. So that's that's what drag means to me for my queer identity and the way I sort of navigate gender. Um, for me, I love the artistry and the performance. Um, yeah, so I guess that's my answer. <laughs> I love that. When you, you have to cut me off if I start talking too much. <laughs> no, please talk. Honestly, I, I love it. And I love listening to you. I think I've, I've said in other episodes, but my goal for this podcast is if there is any like LGBTQ youth or young teenagers or young adults that are trying to find their footing right now in the world, while it's so hectic and chaotic and there's so much happening, mm -hmm. I just want this podcast to be like a little place of peace where they can feel understood or hear stories that they relate to and be able to use that as a tool for them to be able to keep going and feel confident and know that things get better. So when you were younger and obviously raised in a Catholic family, mm -hmm. how was your experience with coming out? Um, I, I used to be very religious before I was very gay. <laughs> and I used to think that, you know, God... Give me my favorite quote from this whole episode. <laughs> I used to think that God, you know, didn't want me to be gay, wanted me to be straight. It would disappoint my teachers and my parents if I was gay. So I really tried to hide it at first. And I was like, kind, you better not fuck this up right now. You're going to grow up. You're going to be straight. You're going to marry a woman. Um, you don't have to have sex with her. You can just kiss her on the cheek. And then you're going to sort of have a white picket fence. That was like what I was telling myself in my head. Um, then when I was maybe 13 or 14, my parents kind of burst my bubble. They basically asked me like are you gay like it's kind of obvious <laughs> and I was like wow. yes I am <laughs> they called you um, right out <laughs> they did well what they actually said they were like do you have anything you want to share with us anything about you about your identity so I was like thinking that just gently know, clocking pretty... you <laughs> literally and I was gagged because I was like well I was supposed to choose when I did this you guys but I'm honestly thankful they did, because if they hadn't pushed me out that closet, you know, maybe I would have never had the willpower to do it on my own. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad, you know, they did that. Obviously, they had a lot of questions. 
Um, but they came around in the end and they did accept me and they did embrace me, um, which meant that I could fully spread my wings and not have to hide anymore. And I could start wearing makeup at school and I could start um, dancing how I want to dance and not sort of having to worry about, is there a limp wrist over here? Um, so I'm, I'm really glad that I did come out in that way. And with your dad's passing, um, was your dad, I think you mentioned that he had gone to a couple of your shows and was supportive of drag and had gotten to see you in drag. He never, um, he never went to my shows because I guess it was before I technically was doing drag. He saw me in like a full face of makeup. Um, and at first he was sort of like asking like, why do you want to do this? Um, why do you care so much about like covering your face with another color and like buying all of these powders and jewelries? Like what is, what, what's going on here? Basically was how he was reacting in the beginning. But I think over time, he saw that it was something that was really important to me. Um, and he never tried to uh, sort of make me stop. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in fact, towards the end, as sort of his cancer was getting worse, he really just embraced me and said, kind, you know what, like, be you, live in your truth and be strong. Um, and so he passed away with us like really being close in the end, which I'm happy about. I love that. How has your journey been with the grief since his passing? I think, um, gosh, it's been, it was 18. So that it was um, seven years ago now. Um, and I feel like I've really grown and I've matured as a man. And I feel like I have become so much more independent because I feel like I have to sort of fill his shoes. Um, so I, I don't think of it as grief so much as I think of it as me maturing mm -hmm. well it sounds like you took the grief and almost turned it into like a form of responsibility yeah it was, it was sort of like a loss of innocence moment mm -hmm. i feel like grief like i've experienced a lot unfortunately in my life and i think that every single time that i've experienced it it's changed me in some way mm -hmm. um like the most impactful i lost my god mom who was like a mother to me she raised me i spent majority of my life with her mm -hmm. um and she had Crohn's disease and it was something that was kind of coming, but my family on that side was really broken and it was just a messy situation. It took a while for me to know that she had actually passed because she was in a different area oh. and the hospital wasn't calling. So there was just a lot, mm -hmm. but I know what you mean by like stepping into responsibility because I did feel an added responsibility after she passed to try and like make sure that everyone was okay. And I almost had to like come to terms with the fact that I had to let go of that. And it was just like, mm -hmm. I I can't take on all this responsibility to try and keep a family together that just isn't there anymore. Um, and then I lost my best friend in 2020 to just like really rare circumstances where a doctor oh, missed sorry. an infection that she had. And she went back to the hospital multiple times. And um, she ended up passing away because she went septic. And by the time they knew she was septic, she was just too far gone. And... Oh. That one was just like, it's like the person that you never think is going to leave. I feel like when I lost my grandparents mm -hmm. or even sometimes a parent, there's still like a natural cycle there where you have, I don't know if it's like added acceptance or clarity, but it's something that you're almost bracing for your entire life. Mm -hmm. Whereas when it's like a best friend or a sibling or somebody that's really close in age, you think that you're going to be doing all these things like going to each other's weddings and this and that. Oh, and oh. then but it's, it's hard, but grief, it always changes you and you learn yeah. so much from it. But it's such a human thing that no matter if you're queer or what race you are, what your sexuality or gender identity, it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Like grief is something yeah. that we all experience at some point. It's exactly. like the most human thing. Exactly. It, it really connects us all as humans. Mm -hmm. How was your family? Do you feel like you guys are closer now? Totally. We're such a tight-knit group. Well, I'm glad that you have a support network because that's the biggest thing for anyone that's going through grief or is experiencing grief right now. Just find support. I think that's always the most mm -hmm. important step and talk to people about it because you can find community everywhere, but it's Amen. not just for queer people. So you... I had posted something just about your travels circling back because I really want to know this story now. You said something about Nicaragua yeah. and how they didn't like it. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So the, the whole time we're backpacking, right? We're like trying to 
budget and like go on buses. So we're doing these land borders all the way starting in Mexico. And then we reach Nicaragua. I'm at the border with Honduras and Nicaragua. And they take all of our passports, which I've like just learned to accept that someone will take your passport and go into another room with it. Mm -hmm. And they call me out specifically to go into this back room. And I'm like, all right. So I sit down and they start speaking to me. This is all in Spanish, by the way. But they start asking, what's your job? What are you doing here? Um, How long are you staying here? Um, And the first one is the hardest one for them to wrap their heads around because I I basically say I'm an artista. So like I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. And then I explain to them, I'm a drag queen. I do these videos on social media. And then I see on their phones, like they've like fully Googled me. And they have my full bio on like as a WhatsApp message. And I'm like, dude, like, so basically I, I worked out that they pulled me out of line because they probably did a background check and saw that, you know, there's all these articles that have come up about me, my website, I was on a TV show. So I think they just want to pull me aside and ask me all these questions, um, which I found like, it was just weird because I was the only one who they interrogated like that. And there were people I was traveling with who like didn't even know they, where they were going to stay that night. Like they just were going to book their hostel last minute. But at my hostel, they had to call and like ask the front desk, like, who is this person who that's staying here? And I found out that they did that because when I was finally actually let into the country and I get to my to my hotel, they're like, oh, heard you had some trouble at the border. Wow. Like, oh, my God. So they called the people at the hotel asking to see if my story was straight. And then I get into sort of conversation with the girl at the hotel who tells me that she thinks um they are screening for like journalists and activists and like celebrities with like a big following because they think they're going to like report on the political situation in Nicaragua, which I was just not going to do. I was like, I'm really just here to be a tourist. Like, please let me through. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think that was the reason they pulled me aside. And they ended up pulling me aside as I was leaving Nicaragua too to go to Costa Rica. This time I'm the only one who they take my passport. Everybody else on the bus is like free to go. They take my passport, put it in their hands and like walk away into another building. What? Without telling me anything. So Jeez. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, like what is going on? And I like ask everybody, like all the workers, I'm like, mi pasaporte no, um, no, no tengo porque um, es con el um, mujer en la bus. Like I'm trying to explain it in my broken Spanish. <laughs> they end up finding me and they're like, um, they just wanted to again ask me, what's my job? What do I do? How do I make my money? Um, before letting me go. And you weren't in drag for any of this? No, I was not. Um, I think the problem is, and sort of what I've taken away from this, is I, I don't have a drag name that's like different from my government name. Right. So when you look up the name in my passport, it'll always be like Kind Santos, as right. you can find online. So I think the lesson of the story is if you're going to become a public figure, maybe get a stage name or a drag name. Fair. I've never even really <laughs> thought about that because my name, when you Google me, it's just everything that I've ever done comes up. I, but as an entrepreneur, you're kind of stuck. I can't be like, yeah. I'm an entrepreneur with, but this is my stage name <laughs> for all my businesses. Yeah. Maybe I should have I'm, I'm not going to act like it was the worst thing that could ever happen to a human being. I mean, it was a little bit of inconvenience and I was, and I was let through. I was just like, damn, like, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, was there any time where you thought about having a stage name or did you always just go with Kine? I think because I I sort of evolved into a drag queen. There wasn't my first time in drag. Um, Kine was just like, I was my name, my username on my YouTube channel in high school. Wow. Um, I made it online Kine because I wanted it to have my name in it. And I never thought of it as a stage name because like when you, when you set up your Facebook name, you're not going to, you're just going to think to put your real name, right? And I liked kind because it was androgynous and it was unique. So even when I started doing drag, I was like, okay, if I choose a new name, I'm going to like have to start from zero and reintroduce myself to all these people on the internet. Mm -hmm. Um, Even if back then I had like maybe a thousand followers, I was like, oh, this is my little community. I don't want them to forget about me. I changed my name. Of course. Um, So I never changed my name. Um, I always just stuck with kind. And I like love kind. It's kind of unique, except for the fact that if you Google it, it's like a character in Skyrim or something. So you, she'll always be more famous than me. Um, but maybe my goal in life is to to be more famous. I didn't than even that. know that. I don't think I've played Skyrim. Maybe for like neither have I. <laughs> but it's a big people love. There's like diehard Skyrim people out there. 
Yeah, just, it it's seems not like go away. Kine is just a name that was given to that one character and me. And they're like, nobody else called Kine. In- <laughs> what would have been your drag name if you had to choose a new stage name? Okay, I like um, the name Venus. I know it's taken, but I like <laughs> names of planets. I like um, like Greek mythology. I probably would have pulled a name out of there. Um, if not Venus, then maybe like Diana. Um, I, I like names that are still unique. Yeah. Like Kine. Kine is a beautiful name. I'm glad that that's what you <laughs> stuck with because I'm a big fan. When did your love for math begin? Um, oh, ever since I was a little kid, my dad um, was an engineer um, at Toyota. So he, um, I can just always remember him helping me with my homework, helping me add four plus four. And then he said, kind, you know, when you're older, um, you're not just going to do four times one. You're going to do four X plus one. And I was like, oh, what does this X represent? Why are there letters in math? And he sort of was just hinting that, oh, this is um, what you can study in college and university. And I think ever since then, it sort of implanted the idea in my head to, oh, I should be good at math. It's like something that's worth being good at. So I think um, as a child, that was what I made my best subject in school. Mm-hmm. And it was my best subject um, all the way through high school where um, I started doing math contests and my teachers said, oh, kind, like you're so good at math that you should um, be part of the math club and do these math contests. And it, it sort of just became my thing. Um, and I, I really started finding it beautiful when I, when I did these math contests that I chose to pursue it in university and became the math queen. I love that. I feel like we need to redo Mean Girls with you into that math competition. <laughs> oh, in Mean Girls? Yes, that yeah. was literally me. <laughs> I love it. It wasn't that. as flashy with buzzers and like Lindsay Lohan, but it was a little bit nerdier than that, but pretty similar. <laughs> Oh, that's so cool, though. I tried to join a chess club once when I was a kid with one of my, like, childhood friends who was a genius. Like, Mm -hmm. not just, like, a little genius. Like, this kid was probably the smartest person I've ever met in my life to date. Just was, like, six years old and solving, like, stuff university level was just, like, yeah, insane. I wonder where he is now. Anyways. um, And you guys played chess? But yeah, he was like, you should come to this chess club. Of course, he won every single title, every single time. <laughs> but I just, I found it fascinating. There were so many different things. And then when that show came out about chess, Queen's Gambit? Is that what it Queen's was? Queen's Gambit. That that made me into chess as well. Because I also played so it when good. I was little with my dad. Mm. And then when I, watching Queen's Gambit, I like, I took the old chess board out that I hadn't used in 10 years. And I was like, let me play this again. <laughs> Have you kept going with it? No, because me once neither. I learned... <laughs> <laughs> that it was like actually so complicated and like all the moves have different names. I was like, this is a bit too much. It is too much. It got really <laughs> intimidating. But I feel like it's, you know, chess and math and everything. I did an interview with Alicia Silberg and she was mm-hmm. talking about how she sees the world in math and like opportunities and like problem solving. And I feel like math is, it's just, it's such a beautiful thing where it, you know, it is universal. It's cheesy to say it's the same in every language, but It is. And it's something that connects everybody. Math is everywhere. And Mm -hmm. I feel like it's it's really cool the way that you teach it. With the way that you teach it and your core audience, what's your goal from from teaching this? Um, I think my goal is to to get people to see that math is everywhere and that math doesn't have to be just the subject in school where where you learn about um, numbers that you plug into a calculator that feel just like brain teasers and riddles. I want people to see that, oh, it's actually in the way that I walk and in everything that I buy and the way that I interact with people and the way that I make decisions. Everything um, involves mathematical equations that we can learn about. And when we learn about them, we're understanding the mechanics of how the universe is tuned. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's sort of what I think about when I think about math being everywhere. And for your audience, you've got a book coming out soon, correct? Yes, it's called Math and Drag. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, tell me a little bit about the book and who the book is geared towards. Okay, I have the book right here, actually, because I have, um, these are early edition copies, um, because it doesn't come out until March. That is the but hottest a, cover of a book I've ever thank seen. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think I'm the first drag queen to write a math book. Um, but the video I would easily say that you're the first (laughs) to write a math book. (laughs) It 
it's not a textbook. It's like a book with chapters and each chapter sort of is like um, my TikToks where it introduces a topic like probability or game theory or infinity. And it just explains it how I would explain it in, in one of my videos, it explains it in plain words that people can understand. And it sort of unwraps um, the magic of something that you maybe thought was boring in school. In school, yeah. you probably think of probability as, you know, you have red balls in a bag and, and green balls and what's the probability of pulling something out. But I talk about how, you know, we can use probability to predict elections and to predict the future and to um, predict, you know, what's the probability of winning RuPaul's Drag Race and just funny things that we can connect to more in real life. Um, that really is the goal of the book. I love that. Can you read one tiny paragraph from a portion of it as like a teaser? Oh my gosh, that's a great idea. Ooh, let me go. Um, Did you do a probability equation when you joined RuPaul? <laughs> Just out of curiosity? <laughs> no. <laughs> I did not. You know why? Because I was, I was that confident that I was like, I'm definitely getting in. Okay, here we go. I'm going to talk about, this is a chapter of mathematical realness. I talk about how in the 19th century, mathematicians began a quest to start from scratch and reverse engineer all of mathematics, just as Euclid had done to geometry. Some mathematicians thought that axioms could be used to describe everything in mathematics. This effort gave birth to a new branch of math known as formal logic. Up until now, I'd been using the word logic in the context of its everyday meaning, which has to do with common sense reasoning and rhetoric. Formal mathematical logic is the study of the rules, axioms, and language used to describe math itself. Meta, I know. Consider the following three sentences as, as an example. All drag queens wear blue eyeshadow. Anna is a drag queen. Therefore, Anna wears blue eyeshadow. So that is a chapter that goes into logic and how, what truth really means. So that's just a little excerpt. Um, but I talk about um, logical arguments like Anna wearing blue eyeshadow. It's so cool though, because I was I've always been fascinated in law. And when you take mm -hmm. like I took an intro law, and when you take it, there's a lot of like math intertwined into different studies in every study, but mm -hmm. with logic and then again probability and everything that you're working with that you just talked about, it's interesting to see how it connects to so many different pieces in everyone's career in everybody's everyday life and you know math is just like constantly surrounding us and i was good at math that was my i was the rebel kid you know i didn't like school basically at all i was heavily bullied i just i had like problems with authority surprise surprise i didn't like being told what to do but math was something i loved and i felt like i was good at it was somewhere where like my teacher, shout out Mr. Barker, um, <laughs> he would sit down and if I didn't get something, he'd stay with me after class because that was the only area that I excelled. I feel like he was probably like, okay, if this kid doesn't oh. <laughs> have anything, at least, you know, she's going to have math. But it was something that I just found once you get it and you solve something, like when you have a big equation that you've been working on, you just can't get there. But once the light clicks, Mm -hmm. And then so many other things click because of it. And you actually understand the entire equation. Yes. It's just so rewarding. Like it feels like that missing puzzle piece to complete something. And you're like, I feel like a fucking genius now. I can do mm -hmm. anything. <laughs> it, it, it really feels so satisfying. And really sort of the other big message of the book is that math and drag have a lot more in common than we think so as well. Because we think of math as just being about rules and drag is sort of the total opposite of rules but math sometimes you question the rules and you question why do we think the way we do and why can't what if we tweak this number then everything else will be different and drag sometimes we do have rules just look at you know drag race pageantry sometimes we do want things to fit inside of a box so there's actually a lot more interplay than maybe it seems on at the surface so really sort of what i'm trying to say is that math is also about questioning and um, questioning your beliefs and breaking the rules. Totally. And, you know, trying and trying and trying again. That's <laughs> if anything yep. has taught me resilience, it's my math class. <laughs> For kids that are following you and are learning and finding inspiration 
for anyone that's young and queer and questioning or just feeling really defeated right now, what's your advice to them? Um, I think my advice is just to to keep going and to keep living um, because, you know, I guess it's so corny to say that it does get better. But, you know, when you when you grow up, you can shape your world into any reality you want. You can find your community um, and you can make a job that doesn't even exist yet. Um, which I feel like is something that I've done. So anybody that's young that feels like there's no there's no way out, um, I think you just have to keep fighting and and find your people. When was the moment where you feel like you stepped into your power and realized that you were kind of over that? Like it did get better. And you were like, okay, I'm I'm in the better place. Honestly, probably when when I came out of the closet. Probably like the next day, once my parents knew the truth, I, I really felt I had nothing to hide and nothing to hold me back. And so you came out in school everywhere. You were just <laughs> like, you went screaming with a pride flag. Pretty much. I, pre I pretty much did the equivalent of that. I started wearing makeup. Um, and like by makeup, I don't just mean like concealer. Like I mean like blue eyeshadow and like black lipstick. <laughs> was anyone surprised? And a full or was everyone coverage. just like, yeah, that's I think kind. People honestly, I think people respected it because they were like, okay, like work, like you're gonna wear a full face of makeup and get straight A's. Like you better work. I think that um, my motto has always been to fake it till you make it, and to just put on that brave face, like. Uh, like a mask because mm. it's like Superman's cape. And that's sort of, you know, you, now you see where I, where I was when I came to Drag Race. Totally. I think makeup for me was such a an armor when I first came out as trans. And it was like my mm -hmm. way of kind of shouting to the world, like I identify as feminine and hopefully this will help because I was, I'm tall, I'm six foot one. I had really short hair. I just, I looked very masculine presenting at the time there was nothing mm -hmm. I could really do I just started hormones it was just that was the cards I was given and it was really my armor for a long time and then as I got further into my transition I had started my cosmetic company and then it it started to play into my insecurities where all of a sudden mm -hmm. I didn't want to leave the house without a full face on I was every single morning I was up an hour an hour and a half a day to make sure that like I had a full face anywhere I went, like this could be just to the grocery store for three minutes. It was mm -hmm. like, okay, got to do a whole face. And so then I kind of had to strip everything away and get to like my divine feminine core and mm -hmm. become okay with everything that I was. So like I stopped getting my nails done. I stopped, you know, getting massive lashes. I stopped wearing makeup. Mm -hmm. And I just had to kind of sit in my like uncomfortability for a minute to feel like I could find my confidence and like, feel beautiful from within. Mm -hmm. And that's why so many people, when I have conversations about OYT cosmetics, they're like, oh, you're a beauty brand. I'm like, we're not a beauty brand. We don't preach that we make you more beautiful in any way. Mm -hmm. Like my cosmetic company has always said, you are beautiful on your own and we are a tool for you to mm -hmm. express yourself and, you know, artistically, if that's what you want to do. But it's something for self-expression. It's not something to help you feel more beautiful because that's where I got mm. mixed up and I love drag because it is such a form of self-expression and the artistry that goes into so many incredible makeup artists is it's just phenomenal like I still watch some kimchi tutorials and I'm fucking gagged by the makeup that they do it's just it's absolutely insane I know I I love everything that you said I love how you said that makeup was like an armor and like a form of self-expression because, you know, when I started out, it sort of felt like I'm just painting on a canvas and this is sort of fun putting on eyeliner. And then I reached a point where I loved it so much that I couldn't take it off and I didn't want to leave the house without it. And it sort of felt like I was hiding behind it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, That's exactly so what happened to me. It was a bit of an irony in that we put it on and we feel beautiful on the outside, but we have to push past that and make the beauty go deeper. And once we can feel beautiful on the inside, then we realize, oh, I don't actually need this all the time. I can put it on. I can take it off. I can change it up, but I don't need it. Totally. A hundred percent. And it's weird because it's such a... Having an insecurity about your body is something that is just so corely human. For me, it was acne that I was covering up as well in high school. 
Right. See, I was lucky I didn't have any problems with acne for the most part. I mean, obviously, teenagers, you have some here or there. For me, it was just facial feminization was like I was addicted to anything that was going to make me look more feminine mm-hmm. and be perceived feminine. Mm-hmm. And then I realized there was so much shame around that being as a trans person because it was like, well, I don't want to be seen as trans. I want to be seen as a woman. And mm. I'm like, what? That that in itself is wrong. Like, I need to be proud that I am a trans woman. I've, yep. I've been out since I came out. I never lived stealth. I just didn't think it was an option. And now the world is getting scarier. And there is a luxury if you have the ability to be stealth because Mm -hmm. you can try to tune out the abuse for a bit. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not ideal for our community that we have a bunch of people that are living stealth. But if that's Mm -hmm. what they need to do for their safety right now in the world, then I completely support that. But for me... It, there are moments now where I'm like, would it just be easier to just shut everything down, sell my companies, and just live under the radar? Because there's so much constant abuse. And then on top of that, you're going through your own poor identity and trying to make yourself feel loved and respected as a person. Mm-hmm. And you go through all these things, like me with makeup, where you're right, like you take your mask off, you put it on, but then you're going up against a world right now that is ex- extremely discriminatory yeah and it's like fuck you need your mask but Mm -hmm. you need to feel beautiful underneath it too so there's so many elements that we have to work through i think as queer people and people that cross the borders of gender identity and gender expression um there's just there's so many challenges but at the very deep down it, it has to start with feeling beautiful because then whatever you're contributing at least you're contributing confidently and authentically Yeah. And you like raise a point that I didn't even think about, which is like trans people having to use makeup like as safety, whether or not it makes them feel beautiful or artistic, like if it's just a matter of life and death for some people. Um, And I like I didn't even think of that. So I loved I loved everything that you just said there. Thanks. So speaking Mm -hmm. on makeup, where do you feel the most confident when you're doing your makeup? Like, what is it that makes you feel like kind? Where is that like? Oh gosh! Oh, um, maybe the glitter. The glitter, <laughs> I, I, I love. <laughs> if I don't put glitter on my eye, I feel like I'm not in drag. Um, <laughs> it's just that sparkle, and you know when I put on the false lashes and um, the wig, and I just feel my fantasy. It's honestly, I feel you just. There's something about you in drag that is so approachable. I feel like maybe it's the way you Thank communicate you. while you're in it. But you know how there's some drag queens where like you like look at them from across the room and you're like, holy shit, that's terrifying. <laughs> like, I do not want to go up against you with a 10 foot pole. But <laughs> for you, there's just there's something like homey. It's weird. I think it's well, maybe the you. way that you I really, you I really, contribute, but yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And I really I really take that as a compliment because I feel like that's um, been something that I've I've been working on. <laughs> really? I feel like you look. Yeah, you just. You're somebody that could come knock on somebody's door and just be greeted with such love and respect, you know? Like, you Thank just you. have that energy. Thank you. Do you ever do drag? I've never done it, and I've been terrified really? of it. And then there's internalized transphobia here, too. I was talking about this the other day with my friend that does drag, mm-hmm. and I they were like, would you ever just do a pop-up show for us or, like, anything like that? And I was like, you know, I just don't... I don't... No, I don't think so. And then... They were like, is it like uncomfortable for you or is it just like intimidating? And then I had to think about it and I was like, I don't know. Now I feel like I don't want to be perceived as a male dressing up as a female. Mm -hmm. And then there's just like this whole other thing that I brought up and I was like, fuck, now there's so much to think about in that aspect too. I just feel like maybe one day, like if I had... Mm -hmm. I felt really confident and comfortable and it was right place, right time for sure. Or if it was like, for a fundraiser like i'm always yeah. i'll do anything yeah. to raise some money for lgbtq youth like i don't care put me in a gator let, pit let or me ask you tent. this do you, ha, have you had a moment where um you you're doing some transformation um with makeup do you ever feel like when you're getting glammed or have you like had that moment where you've maybe put on a wig or finished the end of your makeup and you felt like i have transformed into a different person I think when I was first starting to transition, 
it was mm-hmm. drastic for me, like the makeup on, makeup off. And I was wearing yeah. a lot of it. And mm-hmm. that for me felt like the transformation because I felt comfortable and I felt like I looked how I wanted yes. to feel on the inside for the first time. And I was like, okay, I feel like myself. And then I can go out and be more confident and contribute, you know, into my life in a more authentic way. Whereas without it, it was, mm-hmm. I felt like a, a, like shriveled up dog that was just like terrified and scared and didn't want anyone to look at me. And, you know, it's, it's just defeating mm-hmm. that confidence. is It's hard when you just, you're quiet, you're silent. I was scared of my voice for so long yeah. because I just felt like my voice was not as feminine as I want it to be. And so I never wanted to have a podcast. I never wanted to do anything that was speaking mm-hmm. all of our articles when I was first starting to get pressed for the companies, it was all written. I was like, I don't want to do anything besides one radio show I said yes to. Mm-hmm. But I was just like, I hated hearing my voice. And so I think it's building into that. But now transformationally, I mean, I accidentally dyed my hair today. That was kind <laughs> of a transformation that surprised me. But I think I've just gotten, I've t- stripped so much away in the last year to just get confident with my core. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think I've had like a big transformation moment yet, but I'm excited to have one. So we'll see. Maybe one Mm -hmm. day. If you ever have a show and you're like, we need a a trans girl in here, just give me a shout. I will. I will. I'd love that. As a drag educator, what is your thoughts on what's happening right now in the States? Um, Gosh, I think it's so disappointing i think that um you know we've seen sort of conservatives do this move um to gay people in the past and trans people drag queens they um always have some scapegoat that they're trying to push the problems of society onto they're trying to make their um voting issue to get people to go to the voting booths and this year it was drag queens and trans people and i just think it's so sad and it's so archaic and i and i feel like giving up some days but i also feel like my way of fighting that is to live my truth and to put a good foot forward and be that approachable drag queen that makes you think oh um drag queens aren't just the stereotypical monolith like they actually um can exist in all sort of walks of life maybe a math educator Mm -hmm. so that's been my way of trying to combat that energy and i love that i think that you're right and i feel like so many different politicians right now just care more about headlines than they do about actual politics and no you can't tell me that they care so deeply about you know what bathroom a person goes into all of a sudden just because it's the thing that's trending on twitter i really hope that they don't actually think these things and i well i mean did you see what pornhub just came out with where no it was what? like the, so their top searches obviously you know trends is mm-hmm. one of the top searches big surprise mm-hmm. and then they released the states that it was most searched for like um they mm-hmm. typed in keywords words oh. that are fairly derogatory but are used in porn uh-huh um and of course republican majority states were all the highest searches. So Mm -hmm. it's just classic. But (laughs) I think when we look at the states and we look at what's happening, when you hear about politicians making moves, especially towards drag queens that are helping educate our youth with age-appropriate books and are showing love and compassion and teaching community and support, you know, that's not just for queer kids. That's for kids in general. There are so mm-hmm. many children suffering from depression and anxiety. And it's not just queer youth that are going through that. And giving youth tools to find community and be able to find mental health support and love and respect in wherever they are, it's it's so important. And it's, it is defeating to see things constantly going backwards. But that's why I just, I admire you so much. I admire... Thank all of the so content much. that you put out because you teach in such completely artistic but like very new fun engaging ways with not just math but compassion and empathy and then also sharing your story and teaching vulnerability and and being who you are and authentic it's great i just i love it and i'm i'm grateful i'm so grateful 
that you came on this podcast and oh, had this chat you. because it's important that everyone knows what it's like to keep going and sees people that are going in their everyday life and going up against adversity and whatever that means, even when it is tiring and paving the way for LGBTQ people to be able to follow their dreams and do things that they want to do with their life and know that they can occupy the space that they take up and feel confident in who they are. Thank you. So when does the book come out? The book comes out March 5th, 2024, and you can buy it wherever books are sold. Anywhere? Uh, Yeah, we're trying. We're trying. (laughs) Amazing. Wow. Thank you so much for coming on. And I can't wait to sit down. If you're ever in Vancouver, we will definitely get together and go to a drag show. Yes, I would love that. Um, I Hopefully, I'll go there on my book tour. Um, so hopefully, there's more details on that um, when this podcast comes out on my, on my social media pages. Thanks, Kain. Thank you. I feel like this was a therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. That wraps up today's episode of The Braveyard. And I can totally agree with what Kain is saying because these podcasts feel completely like therapy to me. I went into this wanting to just be able to contribute conversation and a little piece of the puzzle to the LGBTQ community to hopefully provide some inspiration and a safe haven right now for everything that we're going through in the world and everything that we're up against. But it's really turned into therapy for me too, having all of these conversations, finding all of these different people and different walks of life that are living authentically and showing up every day and contributing to the good fight. It's really just motivated me and I hope that everyone's taking away from that as well. Next week, Again, another incredible guest. We have Victoria Peltier, who's just absolutely astounding at everything that she does. The term girl boss quite literally was invented by her. I can't wait to share more all about that conversation next time on The Braveyard.